Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Daphne Stereotis, and I'm an associate with CAQH Core. It's my pleasure to welcome you all to our webinar on the new CAQH Core operating rules. Emily and Lena, our staff group work, work group leaders, will walk us through the requirements of the new value-based payment and connectivity operating rules. Bob Bowman, our director, will join them for a conversation about the benefits of implementation and contextualizing the rules, the new rules within a larger discussion over topics such as interoperability and provider burden. Finally, we'll conclude today's session with a questions and answers period, answering questions from our audience. A few quick logistical items. A copy of the slides and the webinar recording will be emailed to you tomorrow afternoon. However, you can download the slides now on the GoToWebinar dashboard on the right of your screen. I also want to encourage you to submit your questions at any time during the webinar by typing them into the questions panel on your dashboard. Um, I'm going to give a brief overview of CAQH Core for those of you who are new to the organization. CAQH Core is made up of participants re representing 75% of the insured U.S. population, including health plans, providers, government organizations, standard setting organizations, associations, vendors. We represent a wide breadth of the healthcare industry. Our mission is to develop healthcare operating rules that support standards and accelerate interoperability and align administrative and cl clinical activities between health plans and providers. In 2012, we were designated as the National Operating Rule Offering Entity by the Department of Health and Human Services. Due to this official designation, part of our role is to develop and test and iterate these rules and ultimately create a certification program where entities can demonstrate to the, their commitment to the operating rules. More broadly, however, we view our industry role as serving as an industry facilitator to help create a better healthcare system. As an organization, we're always looking for ways uh, to make plan and provider interactions less time consuming and more cost efficient. We measure our ROI as well as do a lot of education and outreach to the industry on key topics of interest. Uh, and all of this work, of course, is fueled by our multi-stakeholder core board. Over the past 15 years, CAQH Core has been developing these rule sets to address HIPAA transactions. As you can see on this slide, these include eligibility and benefits, claim status, uh, prior authorization, even premium payment. We have different sets of rules. We have an infrastructure rule that defines very specific types of interactions that take place around response time and system availability. We have different con connectivity rules which, as you can imagine, are an ever-evolving type of rule set due to ch technology changes and security requirement changes, authentication requirement changes. And finally, we also have a data content, we have data content requirements that include the 834 data content rule that was just published. We do have other types of rules that tackle um, other interactions that take place between plans and providers. So as you can see here on the right of the screen, uh, those include our single patient attribution rule, our EFT ERA enrollment data rules, and our prior authorization web portal rule. Again, we're always looking for ways to facilitate and foster um, an interaction that captures uh, a provider's data needs. So with that, uh, we can get started. I'd like to introduce our first speaker, CAQH Core Manager, Emily Tenike. Emily? Yep, thanks, Daphne. Um, so just as Daphne said, um, we're gonna get into an overview of the Core Connectivity Rule version four now, um, which was approved by CAQH Core participants and the CAQH Core board in December of 2020 and then published um, just last month. So uh, as we just saw, um, there are four versions of core connectivity as technology has continued to evolve, but core's vision for connectivity has really remained consistent um, over these versions. And that is to address connectivity and security of administrative data exchange and establish a national-based guiding healthcare communications. 
So with this vision in mind, um, the Connectivity Work Group last year aimed to achieve four main goals in the update to the connectivity requirements. And these first were to align the core connectivity requirements to help support some of the frameworks proposed in the CMS and ONC interoperability rules. Um, this includes the use of REST and other API technology. So some of the more technical specifications would align with where the industry is headed as it continues to progress. Um, the second goal was looking at updating the core connectivity safe harbor requirements and making sure that we're continuing to support existing technologies um, such as SOAP, which we see in connectivity at version three, but also looking forward to what's emerging, um, such as the RESTful APIs, so that we can really ensure um, that a safe harbor is able to support both standards that exist today with some of the more legacy systems in place and that it's also flexible enough to support some of the more modern approaches um, so that we as an industry can really work to improve interoperability. Um, next, the work group thought ahead to um, more recent and also future core initiatives, um, particularly with the newly published uh, BBP operating rules, Lena will go over later in the presentation, and the attachment rules that are in the pipeline. Um, so with that in mind, we wanted to ensure a single uniform core connectivity rule was created that supports the intersection of both the administrative and clinical data exchange. Um, so this update as a, as a single rule that includes all transactions that are addressed in CQH core operating rules. And finally, going back to that vision, um, updating the national floor guiding connectivity communication in the industry. Next slide, please. So some of the key updates included in um, connectivity version four that really aim to achieve the the goals we um, just saw include the use of TLS 1.2 or higher for increased security, um, establishing the use of both authentication and authorization standards. So specifically here, um, adding the use of OAuth 2.0 as an authorization standard, establishing requirements pertaining to REST APIs, um, including API endpoint naming conventions for both X12 and non-X12 payload types. And finally, adding support for the exchange of attachment transactions to support interoperability between um, both those administrative and clinical data exchanges. Next slide, please. So before we get into a bit of a deeper dive of the updated rule, um, just want to highlight here quickly that the requirements in version four are split into two sections. So um, updated SOAP requirements that we see in version three and then new REST requirements. Um, so we'll start by reviewing the updates to the SOAP requirements that were initially included in version three of core connectivity. Um, so as mentioned, the rule applies to both SOAP and REST requirements um, and this means that the scope of the rule is going to be identical uh, for both sets of requirements, SOAP and REST. Um, the updated scope specifies that the requirements apply when trading partners exchange any X12 transactions specified in CAQH core operating rules, both published and those in development, such as the um, attachment transaction uh, that's in the pipeline. So the table here on slide 10 um, shows a summary of the key changes to the SOAP requirements that were established in version three of core connectivity. Um, as you can see, the majority of the SOAP requirements remain unchanged as the goal of this update was really to modernize the existing SOAP requirements and then add um, that support for the emerging standards um, such as REST APIs. So the key changes include updating security requirements to TLS 1.2 or higher and sunsetting um, the deprecated SSL 3.0 standard, adding support for OAuth 2.0 client authorization, um, and as mentioned, adding support for that X12275 attachments transaction. Um, and you see that in purple on the right-hand side um, of this table. <clears throat> 
Next slide, please. So here we'll take a look at the authentication and authorization requirements um, in a bit more detail. The SOAP authentication requirement specifies that HIPAA-covered entities and their agents must support um, X.509 mutual authentication over TLS 1.2 or higher when exchanging messages using SOAP. So this requirement remains unchanged from version three of connectivity, aside from the updated security specification of TLS 1.2 or higher. Um, the SOAP authorization requirement is going to be new with this update and specifies that HIPAA covered health plans and their agents must support OAuth 2.0 client authorization over um, TLS 1.2 or higher. Um, HIPAA cover providers and their agents may optionally use OAuth 2.0 over TLS 1.2 or higher when exchanging messages using SOAP. And this is an important distinction um, because as we'll see in a few slides, this new requirement applies optionally to providers when exchanging messages using SOAP, but it applies to both health plans and providers when using REST. Next slide, please. So now we're going to transition to the new REST requirements. Um, as a reminder, this is an update to version three of Core Connectivity, um, which did not include REST requirements. So um, as you'll see on this slide, uh, many of the requirements do align with the existing SOAP requirements, but um, their inclusion in the rule is new. So again, here we have a high level overview of the key REST requirements. Um, and the scope of the SOAP and REST requirements is identical as mentioned um, in the last section. So again, the REST requirements apply only uh, apply when trading partners exchange any X12 transaction specified in CAQH core operating rules. So I'd like to highlight um, that while the rule specifically applies when trading partners are exchanging X12 transactions specified in CAQH core operating rules, the rule, um, similar to previous core connectivity rules, does remain payload agnostic. So what that means is that the SOAP and REST services are not aware of the content um, that they're serving, and the rule may be applied to X12 and non-X12 payload types, um, such as HL7, CCDA, doc, doc, PDF, et cetera. Um, so as I mentioned, many of the REST standards and requirements align with the updated SOAP requirements, and we see those highlighted in the blue box here. Um, and then the areas in the purple box are those new REST requirement connectivity areas that we'll be walking through in more detail um, on the next few slides. Next slide, please. So um, this slide should look familiar, um, similar to the standards specified for SOAP message transport, the REST requirements specify um, REST API interface format and authentication and authorization requirements for REST exchanges. Um, the requirements include that JSON must be used to exchange REST messages uh, due to variations and to um, to reduce those variations and enable greater interoperability in the industry. Um, and then mirroring the SOAP authentication requirement, the REST authentication requirement specifies support for X.509 mutual authentication over TLS 1.2 or higher. However, as mentioned in the SOAP section, um, the REST authorization requirement differs in that it specifies that all HIPAA covered entities and their agents must support OAuth 2.0 over TLS 1.2 or higher when exchanging messages using REST. So again, that, that differs from um, when using SOAP. Next slide, please. So the next REST requirement um, we'll look at pertains to specifying REST versioning to enable version navigation and discovery um, and to simplify version management. So the REST requirements specify that versioning for REST APIs should be maintained via um, the URI path. 
And then additionally, in order to communicate the use of the safe harbor, um, which we'll go over in just a few slides, um, versioning for the CAQH core connectivity rule should be maintained via the URI path. So here at the bottom um, we see, of the slide, we see an example of versioning management, specifying the REST API version, um, and then the yellow highlighted text refers to a modifiable versioning variable. And this is included um, in the draft, in the rule as well. Next slide, please. So the next requirement specifies API endpoint naming conventions. And in this requirement, each X12 transaction um, points to, uh, transaction set points to a specific payload type. So in the rule, an API endpoint um, refers to one end of a communication channel where you can locate and access a resource um, to carry out a function. So the rule requirements for the API endpoints require the use of standard naming conventions, uh, which you can see in the table in the right, um, in the column labeled endpoint name. So this is to streamline and support uniform um, REST implementations and the endpoint names listed in the table align to the various X12 payloads. So I mentioned a few slides ago, um, that the rule is payload agnostic. Um, so both the SOAP and REST requirements. And this really means that the rule requirements support other non-normative, non-X12 payloads that aren't listed here in this table as well. So this will enable the rule to support a variety of data types and allows capability with existing and emerging standards. Um, and as the industry, continue, industry continues to evolve, the rule may be updated to include um, normative non-X12 payloads as well. But here we just have um, the X12 payloads in the table. Next slide, please. The next requirement we'll look at is the REST um, HTTP request and response metadata. Similar to the SOAP metadata, if you're familiar with um, Core Connectivity version three, that's um, specified in that rule. The tables um, for the REST metadata contain um, parameter fields, descriptions, intended use, values, and examples. So the parameters contained in the rule really serve as a base um, of what is required by the core REST requirements, but additional requirements may be added by entities um, as needed. So the metadata um, listed in the rule really establishes a floor and not a ceiling in terms of um, what an entity may include. Next slide, please. So this slide um, describes a really critical component of core connectivity that I mentioned briefly um, earlier on, and that is the safe harbor concept. Um, so again, if you're familiar with previous core connectivity rules, um, version four of core connectivity is a safe harbor similar to those um, prior rules, and it's a safe harbor for the exchange of SOAP and REST messages. Um, and as such, specific conformance requirements do apply to stakeholders um, that choose to implement the rule. So. Here we see that health plans or clearinghouses to servers must support all connectivity methods. Um, so here that means both SOAP and REST requirements. Then providers or vendors um, or clients must support at least one of the connectivity methods. So they can support either SOAP or REST. Um, and this is, again, a really key component of core connectivity because Although trading partners can choose to utilize other connectivity methods um, if agreed upon, if a trading partner insists on using the core safe harbor, that request must be accommodated. Next slide, please. Okay, so um, here we have a summary of the core connectivity rule version four. Um, 
a lot of the requirements that we just went through. Um, and again, it both updates existing CAQH core connectivity version three requirements by adding support for the exchange of attachments transaction, um, updating security specifications to TLS 1.2 or higher, and adding that OF 2.0 um, as an authorization standard. And then um, it also establishes the new REST requirements to support the emerging technology um, in the industry today. And again, these new REST requirements uh, include support for X12 and non X12 exchanges, um, such as HL7, CCDA, PDF, et cetera, um, the use of JSON support for specific HTTP methods, including POST and GET to exchange method messages, um, as well as HTTP error handling and status error codes to communicate errors received, um, support for REST API and core connectivity versioning, and specifying API endpoint naming conventions. So with that, I'd like to hand it to Lena Gerimerium, um, core manager, uh, to continue with a review of the BBP rules. Thanks, Emily. Um, so uh, as Emily just noted, we will be talking about the value-based payment operating rules, which were also approved by core participants in the core board this past December, and were published and ready for implementation um, just last month. Um, so, as Daphne and Emily both noted, CAQH Core has been uh, focused on improving the healthcare revenue cycle for many, many years. Um, but over the past uh, few years, we started to look broader from just the fee for service revenue cycle and wanted to take a look at this spectrum from fee for service to capitated payments as payment models evolve to lower healthcare costs. Um, so after two years of research, CAQH Core identified five opportunity areas in the industry that could smooth implementation of value-based payments and reduce provider burden across the revenue cycle. Um, one of the biggest findings of this is that it can't just be one type of stakeholder that takes on this burden. Stakeholders have to act decisively and collaboratively to prevent value-based payments from confronting the same roadblocks that happen in fee-for-service. Um, so CORE's vision for their VBP efforts is a common infrastructure that drives value-based payment models by reducing administrative burden, improving the exchange of information, and enhancing transparency across the clinical and administrative sectors. Next slide, please. Um, so of those opportunity areas, the uh, CAQH CORE participants decided to first focus on provider and patient attribution. So when we talk about attribution, we talk about the method by which uh, individual patients um, within a population are assigned to a provider. And this ultimately determines the patients for which a provider is responsible for. Um, and that will determine uh, a lot of the metrics underpinning VDP, such as the financial incentives for providers, as well as quality measures. Um, so while health plans will supply attribution information on a regular basis to providers, providers are often left with several questions. Um, first, why is this patient in my population? Um, the methodology behind attribution can vary from payer to payer. Um, and often providers are left wondering why this patient belongs to their population, especially if it's a patient with which they have no prior relationship. Um, the second question, Who's on first? Um, especially for patients that have chronic conditions, there can be multiple providers involved uh, in that patient's care. Um, and many of them might act as a primary care provider. Um, patients with diabetes might see their endocrinologist more often than they do their primary care provider. Um, so in that scenario, who is actually responsible for the uh, total cost of care, the financial incentives required of the value based payment model? Um, next. Who else is involved? Often, uh, value-based payment models seek to limit what we call leakage, so having patients visit providers outside of that network. Um, so unless a provider knows where else the patient is seeking care, they're not gonna be able to prevent that leakage. Um, so provider success under a VP model requires knowing the answers to all of these questions. But before that, 
before asking any of these questions, a provider needs to know, is this patient in my attributed population in the first place? Next slide, please. Uh, so this is a typical revenue cycle workflow and it helps illustrate why provider attribution information is important in the first place. Um, so first, a patient will schedule their appointment with a provider. Um, often, as soon as that appointment is scheduled and right before the visit, a provider will send an X12-270 eligibility and benefits request um, asking a health plan, is this patient eligible for the services they signed up for? Um, the health plan will respond, uh, you know, yes, this patient is eligible for these services uh, and therefore the provider will move on as business as usual. However, when they go on to submit those claims for the services rendered, the provider does not know at the point in time that this patient is actually part of their value-based payment population. Um, so when they receive their remittance advice or at the end of the year when the VUP contract is evaluated, they've actually lost out on dollars because that patient was not supposed to receive specific services or because um, they do not meet metrics for quality measures that are listed in their value-based payment contract because this patient is in that value-based payment population. Um, meanwhile, a provider is receiving several rosters from each health plan that they work with, um, giving lists of patients that are in their population. These files come in different formats. They might be via email, uh, integrating CEHR, downloadable uh, Excel files for FTP sites. And they occur at different frequencies as well. Um, one health plan might send monthly updates, one might send yearly. Um, so a provider receives these inconsistent updates and has, at, but at the point of time of service, has no real way of knowing um, without a lot of back office work, whether or not the patient in front of them is actually part of the value-based payment population. Next slide, please. So this is where the new CAQH4 operating rules come in. The CAQH4 operating rules have two sets. Uh, one focused on single patient attribution status and the other focused on attributed patient roster rule set. So the single patient attribution status data content rule builds upon the mandated CAQH4 eligibility and benefits data content and infrastructure rules. Um, basically, it requires a health plan to, in that eligibility and benefits response, notify a provider whether or not the patient that that request was sent about is in their value-based patient, a value-based payment population, as well as the effective dates of attribution. The attributed patient roster rule set rules um, standardizes the minimum data elements a health plan must return to identify the patients in the VVP population, um, including contract name and dates of effective attribution every time they share a roster with that provider. The infrastructure rules in this rule uh, also standardize the expectations for exchange, uh, including requiring that health plans send providers an updated patient roster at least once per month. Next slide, please. So now we'll go into a little bit of a deep dive for the single patient attribution status rule. Um, as stated previously, uh, this rule builds on the current mandated CAQH4 operating rule. Um, but uh, this data content rule builds upon the current data content that is in these mandated operating rules. Um, so in addition to the return of health plan name, patient financial responsibility, eligibility dates, and network variances, um, there, there will be a few more data content requirements. Uh, but the infrastructure and connectivity requirements will stay consistent. Next slide, please. Um, so the eligibility and benefit verification transaction is the most common administrative transaction conducted between a provider and a health plan. And this data content rule builds on that existing, op uh, builds on existing operating rule. Um, so that way, when a provider sends the eligibility request, with no additional effort on their part, the health plan will then return the attribution status of their patient. Um, with an industry adoption rate of 84%, um, this transaction set creates a consistent pathway for providers to receive a single patient's attribution status. Um, the use of the existing XL transaction also helps bridge the gap by meeting providers' needs now 
as the industry continues to pilot and test new and emerging technologies and standards. Next slide, please. So the scope of the operating rules for VBP, um, the value-based payment subgroup and review work group that wrote these rules decided that they wanted to limit the scope of this data content operating rule to only value-based payment models that cover most patient services, um, i.e. those that cover um, primary care, typically. Uh, the reason why they did this is because we wanted to first apply it to a simplest value-based payment model that would enable more rapid adoption and implementation of the operating rule, uh, allowing more mature, mature organizations to apply it to more cases that they choose to. So the single patient attribution status data content rule applies when the individual is located in the health plan system. Um, the health plan conducts provider attribution status to support an overall value-based payment contract pertaining to most patient services. Uh, and whenever a health plan receives a generic uh, 5010 270 or a health plan receives an explicit 270 for the service type codes uh, required in the currently mandated eligibility and benefits operating rules. These rule requirements will not apply when a health plan conducts provider attribution status to support specific episodes or bundled payments um, or attribution for the purpose of quality measurement. Next slide, please. So the expanded data content requirements in this single patient attribution status rule are as follows. Um, so the first data content uh, requirements simply requires conformance with the existing eligibility rule set. Um, the next is uh, outlines how the subscriber or the dependent uh, that is listed in the eligibility transaction uh, must be identified. So it requires the return of an explicit attribution status and the effective dates of attribution status for each of the service type codes. Um, the health plan is also required uh, to develop and make available to the healthcare provider specific written instructions and guidance for the healthcare provider on the implementation of this operating rule um, and the definitions of attribution and attribution status. So within this operating rule, attribution status uh, can be listed as yes, this patient is attributed to you, no, they are not. Um, Partial, as in this uh, patient is attributed to you, but there are also other providers that they are attributed to, um, or not applicable. Uh, patient attribution status does not apply in this case. Um, the third uh, rule requirement um, basically just requires a product extracting the X12271 response uh, to make available the exact wording used by the health plan in that response. Next slide, please. Um, now we'll move on uh, to a deep dive on the attributed patient roster rule set. So this rule set defines the data content and infrastructure requirements for health plans to supply providers with regular patient roster updates in a standard electronic format. Um, so rather than receiving rosters via downloadable FTP sites, ex email exchanges, um, providers will now be able to rely on a consistent uh, flow of information um, whenever receiving patient roster information. So the uh, core participants decided to use the uh, X12-834 benefit enrollment transaction uh, to exchange rosters. Uh, there are three flavors of this transaction uh, and the core participants chose to use the X12-X318-834 member reporting transaction as it was designed to support the transfer of member information both directly to providers as well as through uh, intermediaries such as clearing houses and value added networks. So, this rule set specifies the loop segments and data elements to be used in this transaction to send providers a current list of retributed patients. Uh, next slide, please. Similar to the single patient status rule, uh, the core participants wish to sort of limit the scope of this operating rule set to ensure rapid adoption. Um, so this rule requirements apply when a health plan and its agent make available to a provider a complete roster of patients to a specific value-based contract, and that value-based contract covers the majority of patient services. Um, 
therefore it does not apply when we're looking at episodic types of value-based data models or uh, attribution for the support of quality measurement. Next slide, please. There are three major rule requirements in the data content rule for exchanging patient rosters. Um, the first uh, requires conformance with the current published and adopted CHH core connectivity rule, uh, which will be the uh, 4.0 that Emily just detailed. Uh, second, it requires a health plan or its agent uh, whenever delivering a current roster of patients uh, to use this transaction to identify the provider that is receiving the roster. Um, in, a, in, multiple ca in many cases, a patient may be attributed to an individual provider or a group of providers, so it's important that um, that pro provider or provider group is identified as well as identify the subscribers and dependents covered by this value-based uh, contract. Um, in addition to identifying those patients and the provider, uh, it requires a health plan delivering the roster um, to identify the details of the value-based health plan as well. And similar to the um, X12, uh, sorry, this eligibility and benefit single patient status rule as well, uh, it requires those um, delivering the delivering the roster uh, to return the appropriate attributed patient information for each subscriber and dependent. Next slide, please. So, unlike the single patient attribution status rule, the attributed patient roster rule set also uh, incorporates an infrastructure rule. Um, and this is because uh, the single patient attribution status rule builds on the existing eligibility and benefits rule set, which contains a data content rule and an infrastructure rule. Um, while CAQH4 does have uh, an infrastructure rule that details the benefit enrollment uh, transaction, that covers the 220 flavor of that transaction, which is for employers to send rosters of employees to the health plan for the purpose of enrollment. Um, so that transaction is a one-way push from the employer to the health plan. And therefore, infrastructure requirements sit on both sides of that transaction, both for the sender and for the recipient. The attributed patient roster infrastructure rule for the 318-834 uh, is for health plans to send a roster of patients to a provider. Um, so while it's still a one-way push where a uh, health plan sort of sends it to a mailbox where then a provider can then pick up that roster. Um, requirements only send, only sit on the sender of the roster and not the recipient. So like all state QH4 operating rules, requirements sit on the health plan and not the provider receiving the transaction. And so this small but important difference makes uh, the attributed patient roster transaction a lot more like the electronic remittance vice 835 transaction. Um, this required updates to the rule language to reflect that only batch, batch processing applies, um, as this is a transaction pick, uh, pickup, um, and there's no rule requirements to the recipient of that transaction. Next slide, please. So the uh, draft attributed patient roster infrastructure rules generally aligns with all CA QH core infrastructure rules. Um, so it has connectivity requirements, system availability, acknowledgements, and companion guide requirements. The new part for this attributed patient roster guide is this monthly exchange requirement, which requires health plans and their agents to make an updated patient roster available via the transaction at least once per month. Updated patient rosters must include updated effective dates of attribution wherever applicable. Next slide, please. So now we have the exact same revenue cycle that we looked at earlier, but when we apply these VP operating rules, uh, now whenever the provider sends their eligibility request and receives the response from that health plan, the health plan must inform whether or not that patient is within the provider's value-based payment population. So when the provider is submitting claims for services rendered, they're able to uh, also include information regarding whatever uh, requirements to fulfill those contract needs they have. So where quality measures are associated, whatever reporting uh, metrics are required, 
Um, and that way the provider is not leaving any dollars on the table when they submit that claim. Uh, meanwhile, the provider is also receiving monthly patient rosters via standard format from health plans, uh, which can then allow for easy integration within the provider system. Next slide, please. Um, and with that, uh, we will move on to our conversation on CAKH core operating rules and the benefits and implementation. Thanks so much, Lena. Uh, so before we get into Q&A, uh, I'd like to ask some of the questions that I'm sure are on everyone's mind, namely, how do these rules help bring the industry forward and why should we implement them? So to start off this discussion, I'd like to introduce uh, Bob Bowman, our CAQH core director. And I will actually ask Bob the first question. So welcome, Bob. Great, thanks, um, Nancy. How does, it, <laughs> how does the CAQH core connectivity rule support or align with the CMS and ONC interoperability rule requirements? And why is it important? Yeah, great question. Um, especially as the industry is continuing to develop and advance um, our technology, right? In the technology base, that CAQH core initiated way back when in 2006 with um, some of the very first requirements related to web services. When, when core came out and published our first rule for connectivity, um, we designated SOAP and MIME as requirements for connectivity. So the very first web services for the administrative side of healthcare uh, initiated you know, over a decade ago by CORE. And we continue to do that development. Um, we look at where the industry is going, where the technology goes, um, where implementations have been successful, both in pilots, as well as where, um, really, where is that North Star going? And we look and we survey our CORE participants and they help us guide, they, they pr provide us the guide path for, for that development. Um, in following the, the best technology. And most of that too can originate from initiatives that CMS has or ONC has. And so the, continuing the, the, um, the development of web services like REST um, over the last couple of years in particular, um, and the look and see that the industry is doing with FHIR is really important. And so the core participants um, chose to update and revise the rule just as emily de detailed in her discussion earlier that rest is becoming more and more of a requirement um, for the types of data structures and backend databases that are being used to develop today so it's really helpful that um, the core participants are, are are entrusting um the industry with the latest and greatest technology um, as well as the latest and greatest api structures for the exchange of the data it's really important Thanks, Bob. And a perfect segue into the next question. Uh, how does the, the safe harbor connectivity provision support emerging approaches for exchanging data between health plans and providers? Emily, would you mind taking this one? Sure. Um, thanks, Daphne. Um, yeah, as you mentioned, this uh, aligns nicely with what Bob was just talking about. Um, and I know we've been through quite a bit already on the webinar. So just as a quick refresher, um, that Safe Harbor um, assures that application vendors, providers, health plans can be assured that the connectivity method um, will be supported by any HIPAA covered entity. So, for example, if um, a provider wants to use REST as the connectivity method, um, they can be assured that health plans intermediaries will support that request. Um, so, as Bob mentioned, um, Many of the emerging approaches to exchanging data today um, utilize REST and other APIs. So ensuring that um, health plans, health plan vendors, intermediaries um, support this method of connectivity exchange um, will really help to ensure those emerging technologies um, continue to, to progress and to be um, supported as the industry progresses. Thanks, Emily. And a bit more specifically here, uh, how does the connectivity rule being payload agnostic make things sim simpler for the industry? Yeah, good question. Um, so as mentioned um, during the presentation, um, the core connectivity rule is designed to be payload agnostic, um, meaning that the various payload types are accommodated um, 
and the rule contains both generic and specific examples um, for X12 and non X12 payloads. Um, so what this really means um, in terms of making it simpler for the healthcare industry as it progresses um, kind of towards achieving alignment and interoperability across the um, administrative and clinical systems um, is that by updating common methods of connectivity to include existing and emerging methods and X12 and non-X12 payload types um, for connectivity and data sharing, we continue to ease that administrative burden. Um, so the rules being payload agnostic really offers an opportunity to bridge the gap between the existing and emerging standards by supporting um, just a variety of data types and allowing for compatibility between those existing and emerging standards. So, um, you know, entities at different stages of, of technological progression can begin and kind of continue to interoperate with each other. Thanks, Emily. Now switching gears over to the new VBP rules. Uh, Lena, how do the um, new operating rules help reduce provider burden? And can you walk us through um, what the provider workflow will look like, could look like? Mm -hmm. uh, sure, Daphne. So uh, with these new VBP operating rules, what we really tried to accomplish was not having the provider have to move out of their workflow in order to check the attribution status of a patient. So rather than um, prior to an appointment or even when the patient is already in front of the provider, trying to check through endless rosters from different health plans to see whether or not this patient is attributed to them, um, the front office staff will have already run that eligibility and benefits uh, inquiry and we'll already know whether or not that patient is attributed to the provider. Uh, so now at the point of care, a provider will know whether or not um, a patient was within their value-based payment contract and therefore know um, if there's any process measures they have to complete, any quality measures, um, and also know if there's any additional services that the patient uh, qualifies for. So often health plans as part of value-based payment contracts um, will incentivize uh, patient care management with additional services um, or uh, additional options for patients, um, which it's important that the provider be able to share those with the patient at the time of the appointment. Um, so what the provider workflow now looks like is rather than waiting until the end of the year to run through rosters and figure out what patients um, that were seen, which patients that were seen actually belong to which contracts and therefore which reporting requirements or measurements they need to report by the end of the fiscal year in order to qualify for their full payment. Um, providers can now accomplish this as they go along. Um, they know at the point of care whether or not this patient is in their contract um, and complete requirements as they go rather than you know taking the last three weeks of the year to try and uh, complete uh, medical files for every patient that's walked through their door. Thanks, Lena. Now, taking a step back, um, Bob, how do the patient attribution rules fit into CORE's broader mission and strategy around BBP? Great question. Um, and I think that's what, what's really important, and even as you mentioned earlier, Daphne, our, our mission and vision really are to ensure a more efficient and more effective data flow between a provider and a health plan um, with their designated intermediaries that they, they so choose. So as we look at the details of this particular rule set that, that Lena walked through uh, when it comes to patient attribution related to an individual inquiry using um, an X12 to 7271 eligibility transaction, or looking at a monthly roster that's really, really helpful for providers um, to see those, those kind of gross statements about these are all of our patients for this month, um, using another uh, X12 transaction, 834, it's really important, right? That fits directly in our mission and vision as simplifying and making that exchange of data more efficient, cheaper, easier, and providing exactly the data that the provider needs to make the next business decision that they need to make, right? If it's validating the eligibility of a member, if it is ensuring that um, a particular attachment comes through just the way that it should, or if the remittance advice 
um, shares exactly what the, pay, the provider needs and making sure that they can adjust the patient's um, accounts receivable record uh, just perfectly, just so, so that everyone understands what that charge was for and how it was adjusted uh, by the health plan insurance adjudication. All of that's really important for the industry. So simplifying the data exchange through our connectivity, simplifying the data that is exchanged for the data content, it's all really important for our mission and vision. And we'll continue to do that for value-based payment. Um, as Lena alluded to, uh, we're gonna continue the work in VBP. Um, we're looking at where our core participants wanna go next. Uh, we're going to continue looking at um, uh, potentially some pilots with the information and the data that we hope to exchange and where the core participants and our pilot participants wanna see the next level of data exchange. So. Uh, more to come, um, so pay, pay uh, particular attention to what's coming next from our value-based payment uh, project, project um, and from uh, our potential pilot that we have coming later this year. Thanks, Bob. Um, now a question for Lena. Do provider support or were they involved in the development of the patient attribution rule? Um, great question, Daphne. So, Providers were involved in the development of these rules um, way back when it was just a research project and we were interviewing providers to understand their current workflows and what they wish could be improved, um, all the way to the vote by core participants, um, where um, over 90% of core participants uh, voted for their support of these value-based operating rules. Um, so, you know, in looking at provider administrative burden. Um, we really take to heart listening to providers at every step of the way um, and uh, try to find that middle ground between what providers want and what health plans are capable of doing at this point in time. Thanks, Lena. One final question before we move on to the audience Q&A uh, for Bob. Uh, how do we make sure industry moves forward with adoption of these new operating roles? A key component of our integrated model is to roll out the operating rules for industry adoption and then really drive that adoption, right? We work with our core participants uh, first and foremost um, to have them adopt the rules, run them through potentially core certification. Uh, that is a model that we also have, uh, I'm sorry, an aspect of our model. We have a voluntary core certification program where any entity can go through and certify their systems, their applications, their software that they have in the market to ensure that they meet the requirements of the operating rules. And so we, we do drive that adoption with and through our certification program. We also validate uh, the, 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 the industry implementation through different pilot programs. Uh, I kind of mentioned our VBP pilot coming this year. We also have um, a prior authorization pilot underway. We've recorded on that um, late last year in one of our webinars. I'm gonna to continue to do that uh, this year as well as we have more results coming through. So again, stay tuned for um, some interesting and some great findings from our PA pilot program. But all of that really is to drive adoption, to get entities, health plans, providers, clearinghouses, software vendors, solution vendors to implement the operating roles um, with the, you know, the next level of technology um, and next level of security, authentication, as Emily described in our new version of connectivity, as well as the data content requirements. Again, that data is really important for providers and health plans to change and then to ensure that it's interoperable. Right, to move it from place to place when it's needed to make those next business decisions. So certification does that, the pilot program does that, adoption does that. It does simplify um, the business interchange, exchange of information in that, um, in that data exchange model. So that's what we do and that's what we, what we try to facilitate through CORE. So again, um, please join CORE as a participant or please join us for our next a webinar session as we explain some more of the benefits that we found through uh, the different avenues that we're recruiting information uh, from the industry. Thanks, Daphne. Thanks, Bob. And I'll move us right along into our q and I'd like to remind you to please submit your questions by typing them into the questions panel on your dashboard. Uh, so let's dive into the first question. Um, we actually had a few questions surrounding when um, organizations will be required to implement these rules. I know Bob just spoke about certification, but Bob, can you clarify a little bit when will um, 
clearinghouses plans? When will people need to comply with the new operating rules? Great question and perfect timing too. Um, the requirements that we've detailed in today's uh, webinar related to connectivity as well as value-based payment related to those specific transactions, the 27271 and the 834, those are currently set for voluntary adoption. So we will be driving adoption with our core participants and the rest of the industry to voluntarily adopt these uh, requirements um, and roll them out to their end users, right? Roll them out to uh, your health plans, to your clearing houses, to your software vendors, to your providers, and start immediately um, obtaining the benefits that these uh, new requirements will have on the industry. So we will, uh, the plan is to take these to industry HS and look for HHS for um, a true regulatory adoption process, right? Following that process that I think we've detailed on our last uh, town hall. Uh, but the once we publish the rules, and we just published them in January, just last month, um, they are ready for industry adoption. So entities can voluntarily adopt them now. Thanks, Bob. And another question here. Um, have these new operating rules changed the ability of a provider to authorize who has access to their attribution data during a credentialing event? Uh, in the management of several providers in a primary care setting, the provider usually needs some assistance in the maintenance of the attribution information. Does this ability still exist? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll jump in there, Daphne. So the ability definitely still exists. The operating rules don't touch on that. Basically, the reason why we have the health plan identify the provider to uh, which the roster is attributed to is to ensure that there is less confusion when a when a patient is attributed to an individual provider versus a group of providers. Um, so health plans will only be sending rosters to those that they already have permission to share those rosters with. Thanks, Lena. Um, and since we're coming up on the end of our hour together, uh, I will move us ahead to key takeaways from today's session. So these new operating rules help address changes in technology and payment models, um, and they establish an industry foundation for the sharing of patient attribution information and exchanging data. Uh, and as Bob mentioned, these new operating rules will be ready for industry implementation later this year. Uh, we hope that you'll join us for some of our upcoming events. Ahead of our market-based review of the core code combinations, we will be hosting a webinar on February 23rd. In March, core staff will also be presenting at the Healthcare Payments Innovation Conference and the HIPAA Summit. We wanted to share some of the benefits of joining CORE as a participating organization. As you've seen here today, one of the most meaningful parts of joining CORE is that you drive these rule development efforts and help bring the industry forward. These initiatives and these rules would not be possible without the energy and collaboration of our participants. And that goes back to our mission and vision of creating a results-driven collaborative environment for industry leaders to tackle some of the biggest issues in healthcare. For any of our participants on the call, I also want to plug our participant dashboard, which serves as the new and improved comprehensive resource for all things CAQH Core. Thank you all for joining us today. Once I end today's session, you'll see an end of webinar survey. I know that we went through a lot of topics today and we wanna hear your feedback and questions. Please feel free to email us at core at caqh.org if you would like more information on operating rules or any other CAQH core activities. Have a great rest of your day.